Okay, uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Today is April 9th, 2014. My name is Michael Camo and I'm an editor from Minionville.com and today I'm joined by Sean Udall who is the author of Minionville's Techstrat Report. Sean is Minionville's resident tech guy. He's been researching and trading tech stocks for over 20 years including stints at Morgan Stanley and Solomon Smith Barney and as you can expect we're going to be talking tech stocks, IPOs, bubbles, social media, security super cycle, Facebook comparisons with 1998, the whole shebang. Um, so if you've got a question, please enter it into the chat window. We'll do our best to get to it. And um, so you know this will be recorded. Um, it will be published online. And we will send you a replay so you don't have to email us. OK, now that we've got the um, intro out of the way, Sean, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, so big picture, you know, is the bull case for tech still there? I do. And in fact, you know, had, had we done this webinar uh, two or three weeks ago, or if, you know, if FireEye was still at 90 and, and Workday was still at 110 and Splunk was still at 105, I would say, yeah, you know, I think a lot more caution is in order. But, I mean, if, you, if I kind of go through the checklist, okay, so relative, so this is sort of relative, relative, right? So relative to other sectors, relative to other countries, relative to other groups, if I still look at the earnings picture and the revenue growth picture for at least the tech I like, um, it, it just has far superior sort of relative growth valuations um, to to almost every other every other sector. I mean, there might be a few that that are somewhat comparable, but like we, we, in fact, we were talking before we got on air. Okay, biotech versus tech, especially high growth tech. I mean, you you know you have a lot of biotech with uh, sort of 15 to 25 percent growth rates trading at or twice what a lot of tech companies trade at that have 35 to 65% growth rates. So uh, that's just a great case in point. So a lot of technology relative to biotech is still, I don't know, trading at a 35 to a 40% discount. Um, I do think there's also going to be a cycle where I talk about superior ROE in a rising inflation world. You know, I've, I, I firmly believe we're going to see rising inflation. I, I've kind of been wrong about that. Um, Although I, I haven't really called for it, that, that it was really going to kick in quite yet, but I do think it's going to kick in here fairly soon, and we do have emerging inflation in other areas. So I think that you, you can look, kind of look at any chart. When the Fed foments inflation, um, basically high growth kind of kicks in to overdrive, and those sorts of areas the market tend to do very well. And I still kind of think, you know, everybody worries about the next black swan, the black swan being a negative event. I still kind of think, I mean, nobody really talks about the upside for a potential black swan to the upside. And I've been, I've been writing about this sort of this potential 1998 thesis performing for uh, probably the better part of 18 months. And basically, I kind of nailed it cold because I'd say last year and the 30% return last year and the 50 to 60% return in the high growth tech names, and maybe 100% in some cases, um, we, we got a good taste of sort of that 97, 98 window. Um, as far as what could hurt, I always like to talk about this. So the macro was bad a year or two ago. Now it's sort of improving. However, high GDP growth does not necessarily translate to a strong market. Um, the other thing, I just think it's really interesting, that's that HFT gets on 60 minutes. And last week we had the worst high beta week in, since like the, the late 2011 correction. So, so call it what it is. I mean, I'm not against HFT. But I, I do think they operate with the rules given to them. And I wrote, I was writing about this a ton in 2008 and 2009 in a thing called the uptick rule. And what's funny is they never really reinstated the uptick rule. And that's the ultimate fix. If they bring back the up, uptick rule and HFT works with that parameter, I think it's everything's good to go. And we'll, you know, things will trade the way they probably should. Um, but we'll talk about bubbles later, so I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna look at that. Other than right now, other than say that a ton of the bubble, whatever, a ton of the froth, not all the froth, but a ton of the froth has basically and last week took a ton of it out. Um, and then you know we're gonna talk about what a bubble really looks like and what the what the nice compare contrast. But I think I think on a on an overall thesis standpoint, if inflation kicks in. And relative to other sectors, especially now with the decline and the demise of a lot of high growth names, um, a lot of those those checklist items are are still are still uh, in play. Okay, um, since we have H HFT on the screen, um, very quickly for the average individual investor out there, do you think it's something they need to worry about? You know, on a day to day basis in their trading activities. 
I do want a name like FireEye goes to 90 or 95 bucks. So, so if, if, if you're in a name and it's run crazy and you were lucky enough to buy it cheap or, or catch the early momentum and something goes up 30 or 35 or 50 percent, you just have to take some off the table, maybe even three quarters of it. Even if you love the name long term, you just got to take, I, I don't know, whatever, you know, a third, a half, three quarters. Because as fast as things go up, by the way, I mean, HFT can, I mean, it's not all, it's not all one-sided. It, I mean, these guys can pump stocks, stocks up just as fast as they can bring them down. Um, and again, they work with the rules that are given. I mean, they basically just replace the market making function. And, uh, but, but I, so it, it depends on the circumstances. I, I don't think people really need to worry about HFT, but I think you need to be aware of it and how much faster stocks can move. Okay. Um, so would you say that, um, to divide a little bit that maybe people should be more aware of maybe momentum algorithms and things like that rather than HFT specifically? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it just, I, you just have to be cognizant of the fact that, um, you know, a lot of people worship at the altar of momentum. I, I worship at the altar of relative valuation. And then I, I use technical analysis and, and sort of a big data technical system overlay. Um, so, so, I mean, if you just, I think there's a ton of people trading today that have absolutely no idea what an underlying asset is worth. And I think that creates, that creates a potential problem because, for example, I mean, I, I like Twitter. I love Twitter. I think Twitter is going to go a lot higher over time. But again, if you were buying Twitter at 68 or 72 or buying weekly call options when the stock breached 72.50, if you made money, you were real lucky. So, you know, things like that can reverse very, very quickly. And momentum, especially the, sort of the faster a momentum move occurs in one direction, you're typically going to get a, a similar speed in the opposite direction at some point. Okay, so why don't we jump right into the, 90, the 1998 parallel. Now, 1998, saw, we saw Asian financial crisis, which took a big hit on the market, and then we saw a big bounce back. Now, is there a parallel this year? I mean, is there an event, or did it just happen in the big biotech and momentum crash? Uh, yeah, I think we just got a really good taste of it. May, maybe a big chunk of it just happened. So, so just to back up, so, so I've been writing about this at least for 18 months. So maybe last year was 97 and this year is going to be 98. You know, I'm not sure. But the, the, the best way to think about it is you, had, you did have a hedge fund issue. You had the Asian currency crisis and you had, the, you had a Russian currency crisis. And I think there was even some South America issue kind of thrown in there, it kind of in that, in that whole period. Um, but what the, the, key to, the key to this is what we can learn from this that, that happened then and what we can apply now. So what, ha what is exactly what happened? Well, <clears throat> the first sector that got hit in both the 97 and the 98, the 98 correction was far more severe, but 97 had a pretty big one too. The, the biotechs went, became bio reps first, and then, and then it rolled into tech. And so I, I love to use sort of, well, I mean, it's kind of hard to find the big biotechs of yesteryear because they kind of morphed into what are big technology or uh, big healthcare companies today. And a couple of my favorite ones are basically private companies and don't exist anymore. But so Amgen had two corrections in '97 and '98: a 35% and a 27%. Um, uh, small small cap biotech probably did something uh, twice as bad as that. But what, so then what happened is tech had a big correction. Well, Cisco dropped 40 to 45 percent. Might, might have even gone almost down 50 percent. One of those two corrections. So one of them again was in '97. One was in '8. What And I, I, I use Cisco because Cisco then was a large company, but it was still relatively young. Um, so, so anyway, so basically, after each of those corrections, Cisco doubled or tripled and went to a new high. And well, from from the '98 high, I think it doubled or tripled one more time. But that's kind of what, what happened. Things got overextended. There were some weird kind of macro crisis things that kind of occurred. They weren't big deals, but the froth got taken out. But what happened is there was still enough underlying strength and things were percolating. The Fed was relatively easy. Again, a lot, a lot like today. I mean, stocks will basically, they, they will probably go up until the Fed overshoots to the upside. So the, there's a huge misconception that the minute the Fed starts raising rates, stocks are going to are going to crash, are going to go down, the rally's over. That's not historically true at all. Typically, the, a third of the move or the last quarter of the move is when the Fed starts raising rates to basically until they overshoot. The danger point becomes that last one or two or three rate hikes where the Fed shouldn't have hiked rates anymore. 
So, I mean, who knows when that's going to occur. But that's basically the parallel. And, you know, we didn't really have much of a correction last year. We had a few little ones. We, I mean, this was a big one. I mean, if you, if you owned anything outside of the most boring, stodgy stocks, this did not feel like a 5% correction on the NASDAQ. This felt like a 12 to a 15 percenter because a ton of, I mean, a lot of really good stocks, you, you can call them overvalued, but a ton of stocks went down. I mean, FireEye was down 52% from top to bottom. That is a huge move. So, um, again, we can talk about that later, but that's, I think that's a parallel, and I think, I think it's definitely worth keeping that in mind as you, as you think about what stocks might do in the next year or so. Okay, I'm really glad we just talked about 1990, we're talking about 1998, because I think a lot of people don't really understand what a tech bubble looks like. Now, if you, um, I, was, I was old enough in the late 90s to remember, but I think you have some interesting comparisons here, so why don't you talk about these? Sure. So, okay, so what does a tech bubble, I mean, I, I think we're all seeing a bubble. I mean, so what did I write about in January? 3D printing stocks were a bubble. What have they all done? They basically all crashed. That's been a really good short call. Um, I've kind of been right and wrong. I mean, Pandora went from 38 to 26, 25, but Zillow hasn't gone down. Yelp hasn't gone down. Um, but so, so what, what, what does a bubble really look like? Okay, so we, got a we, we maybe got a little bit of a mini bubble. I would say 3D printing sector wasn't a bubble. Um, I think certain social media stocks are probably approaching, but I don't think FireEye was in a bubble, and here's why. So Cisco, again, it was a large company. Well, this, by, by this time, Cisco was a huge company, had a half a trillion dollar market cap. So when Cisco was the largest market cap company in the world, they traded at 42 times sales. And I think, I, I gotta go back, I think it's 40 times actually forward. It might have been 40 to, 42 times that current year. Um, but you basically, I mean, 42 times sales, that would be like Google trading at 42 times sales. And Google probably trades six or seven times sales right now. Um, that would be like Microsoft trading 42 times sales. So wh whatever you wanna say, that would be like Apple trading at 42 times sales. It's not, I mean, Apple's maybe, what, two or three times sales. So you know, even a year later, even after Cisco basically went down, I think 62% or something like that, it was still trading at 13 times sales. And by the way, most people don't realize this, from the end of 99 to the end of 2000, Cisco actually increased their revenues about 50%. So, so in 99, if you thought that was a peak, a peak revenue year, it actually wasn't a peak revenue year. They increased revenues 50%, but the stock still went down 65%. Um, that, that is a really good example of what a bubble looks like. FireEye was trading about 21 times. Fire is a young company, had a 12 to a $13 billion market cap. Full disclosure, I've been in FireEye since 35 bucks. I was writing calls, as you know, uh, at 75, 80, and 85 dollars and collecting a lot of premium. So I was writing on my newsletter that I thought FireEye, even though I love the name, I thought it was definitely overjuiced anything above 80 bucks. And I was basically writing call protection. Um, but Again, FireEye is not a bubble. It was it got expensive. It now got it got cut in half. Um, but again, it was just nothing like. I mean, a young FireEye wasn't even trading anywhere. Wasn't even trading at half the valuation of what an aging Cisco was trading at. So I've got some other things. You know, Splunk, Splunk is now about 13 times. Rocket or Rocket Fuels about three three and a half times. Uh, everybody, you know, I still kind of wonder about Twitter. Everybody says Twitter is super expensive. It's only 12 times forward sales. That's not that bad. Um, at, at this point, when Cisco was heading into their, or uh, when Google was heading into their second earnings report as a public company, they were around 21 or 22 times sales, forward sales. So Twitter is basically trading at less than half the valuation of Google was at its similar point in history. So the bottom line, they're definitely are rich companies. I've I've had a lot of good short calls this year. Uh, my 3D my 3D industry call was probably the best short call. Um, and that, I, I still think that sector is relatively highly valued. I still think biotechs are way overvalued, by the way. But anyway, that, that's what a bubble looks like. I mean, I, biotech's not trading at 42 times sales. I, it's, it's hard to find. I mean, maybe I could find a tech stock at 42 times sales, but I, uh, of the stocks I cover and recommend and look at and trade myself, I'm, I'm not trading any names that are 42 times sales. So, um, but that's what it looks like. That's what a tech bubble really looks like. Most people probably don't really know. They don't put, put the math to it. They might, might read a snarky remark on, on Twitter or something, but the bottom line is if you go back and do the math, that's what some of the real numbers look like. Okay, um, so that leads us perfectly since we've, we're talking FireEye, the security uh, super cycle. So we've seen 
you know, high, pro high profile break at Target, and I believe they might have ignored something from FireEye. I don't remember correctly, but um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about FireEye? Well, yeah. So I mean, we I've talked about FireEye. I've been on FireEye since the IPO came out. Again, so so my my short my short move here, my short story is that I do think FireEye and Palantir, which is still a private private company, will basically become sort of kind of like what Cisco and Juniper were to the networking sector, you know, in the middle of the late 90s. So they're, they're going to be, or, or what Apple did in the uh, smartphone industry. I think, I think these two companies, and maybe one or two others, but these two companies have a potential to basically gobble up, you know, 65 to 85% of the market share of the industry. Um, so, so I don't like any of the old security companies. I basically think you can basically run pair trades and be long FireEye. Um, and, and basically be short uh, a Symantec or a checkpoint or something like that. Um, and again, now, now that FireEye has been cut in half, I can endorse it. I can really like it. I can say, hey, the fair value is probably 75 to 85. And again, you know, we're going to see this occur over a number of earnings reports. They need to keep delivering. They need to keep growing. But I think all the ingredients are there. What, the one thing I really look at is what is the technology used for? and how big of a tech lead does somebody have from an R&D perspective and from an actual usability case. And FireEye is basically dominate, dominating all the buying interest from the companies that buy that kind of gear. So Palo Alto Networks is in the mix, but I don't think they're nearly as good. I basically think you have FireEye and Palantir. I think they're going to end up kind of owning the industry over time. So, you know, long term, you know, this is like one to two years away. I think FireEye can trade about 150. Uh, again, the stock had no business being at 95 bucks. I think it probably overshot 25 points to the upside above probably where it should have been. So what did it just do? It just overshot 25 to the downside. It probably should have stopped going down at about 70, but it blew right through 70 and went to 48 bucks. So, you know, that's a good example. When, when things get too hot way too fast, that's kind of what they're going to do on the other side of the trade. Okay, uh, let's move on to M&A. Now, um, Deal, what are you seeing deal making this year? Yeah, and by the way, remind me of Veronis. Maybe somebody will ask me a question about Veronis, and I'll, I'll get back to it. So, yeah, I, the, the one thing where, again, this is sort of a parallel with 98 and maybe in early 99, um, there's a lot of companies that almost have to buy somebody. So, and, and we've seen, Vocus got bought out just a, a day or two ago, but we haven't really seen much tech m and and it's kind of weird because the, the old guard is not finding any new growth. They're, they're not R&D in their way to any new growth. The young companies have great growth, great products, great R&D, and plenty of money. So you almost have to have uh, M&A. The year isn't over. I think you're going to have a lot of tech M&A later. And maybe it's going to be kind of like what we saw. I mean, you've seen Facebook be really aggressive with M&A. Um, I mean, FireEye bought a company for a billion dollars. Um, so maybe the M&A is going to be more from the mid-cap companies buying private companies and buying other companies, and maybe the, you know, the old guard's just going to sit back and not do much when they really should be doing something. So um, I, again, the security space, I think the incumbents, they, they, they have to buy somebody or they're going to be in trouble. I, I kind of jokingly say buy or die, I'm not really joking, because I just think they kind of have to do something. Um, the other area that's really interesting. So, so Google years ago grabbed DoubleClick, and then you had Microsoft bought a Quantive. Um, so at one point, you, you, you had a bunch of these ad monetization plays that were publicly traded, and they all got gobbled up. So what do you have now? You have Marin Software, you have Rocket Fuel, you have Criteo, uh, you have Rubicon. So there's sort of a whole new crop of these companies that help, that help sort of real-time monetization and real-time bidding um, on, in, in the digital ad marketplace. Uh, that whole space could be rife with M&A. Um, and then I still kind of think you need this network security convergence. And, and, and that's where I think, you know, I've, I've argued for years that Microsoft could become a very strong, very dominant company in either networking or security. Um, does Apple enter the fray? You know, Apple has, actually Apple has very good internal security in their own. Their software code's written really well. Their stuff's harder to hack. Um, but, you know, one of these two companies could, could, could enter these spaces and, and probably do quite well. Um, I mean, heck, you could, buy, you could buy out the whole fiber optics industry for about $10 billion. I, I, may, I may be joking a little bit, but it probably won't be, take much more money than that. Um, so anyway, well, you know, I do think tech M&A is going to kick in. I think there's a lot of companies that need to do something. 
So maybe what we just need to see is like a Cisco, their, maybe their stock, if they get up to 26 or 27 or $28, you know, maybe they'll do a little better. Uh, maybe it's just a matter of some of these older companies need some, need some currency and a rising stock price uh, to get more active. Intel, by the way, I think Intel is going to go on an M&A push pretty soon. Um, and I still think Apple's got one or two things cooking out there. So we'll see what happens. But, but that's a theme. I think maybe that will kick in in the second half of the year. Okay. Um, so extending the deal conversation, uh, let's talk about IPOs. Um, so w what names do you think people should be looking for? Um, I guess Palantir is one, but what else do you want to see come public? Well, it's sort of, okay, so uh, Square, Palantir, uh, I, I mean, I know Dropbox is going to come up public and probably be pretty hot. I mean, so there's, the, you know, Spotify could, could probably do, in fact, I think Spotify is going to be pretty disruptive. I, I still think Pandora ultimately is going to be a short that works really well. So, I mean, there's going to be a few good ones, just like there were a few good, I mean, Tableau Software was a great IPO. Splunk was a tremendously great IPO. So were FireEye. But what, right now, it's, it's, it's like that movie 300 where the marauding hordes just kind of keep, <laughs> keep, keep coming onto the 300. It, it's, it's sort of the IPO. It's, I mean, if, if I was at an iBank and, and I, was, I would just say, okay, let's just, let's just close the IPO window down for three or four weeks and let's let the stuff cool down a little bit. Um, but, you know, it, it's just this, it, it, it's, it, you can just feel it. It's kind of a rush to the exits and it's not good and it's, it's kind of jamming up the, uh, jamming up things a little bit with too many deals. So, but again, what that's going to do, that's going to create a ton of differentiation. So like Veronis, okay, V-R-N-S. I just bought some of that today. I bought some of it yesterday. They're a tertiary security play. They came public. I love the stock, but I couldn't buy the deal because the stock instantly shot to like 50 bucks. And I was sort of like, yeah, I'd pay 35 or I'd pay 33 to 35 for Veronis. Well, then when the tech wreck happened last week, it shot through 35, went all the way to 30. Then today it hit, I think, 25 and a half. I paid 26 and change. I paid 27 and change yesterday, maybe 28. Um, but this is a really, really interesting company. It's a little bit of Splunk. It's a little bit of FireEye. Uh, in the spaces it competes with, what they do is they analyze unstructured data. So that's this whole mess of everything get, that gets produced by enterprises every single day in emails and text messages and spreadsheets, you name it. Um, so it's sort of an internal security risk for companies. So Veronis has this great, it, it, it's very much like Splunk. So here's the key. People that use Splunk, once they start using an app for, for literally 30, 60, 90 days, pretty much said, oh my God, what did I do before I had Splunk? It's that good of a product. So then Splunk offered the product at a very cheap price, and then they've been raising their price like every six months. I think Veronis is going to come out in space. And basically, I'm hearing the same thing. I know people that use the product. They're just like, this thing is a lifesaver. I love it. I can't. I, the whole finance industry is basically going to buy this product is what I'm hearing. So the bottom line is what you do is you scour for deals that are really good deals that price too high. And now they've come on, you know, now you want them to, you want to find them if they come off 35 or 45 or 60 percent. And that's exactly what Veronis did. It went to like 50 something. It got all the way back down to 25. Bam. 50% correction, I jumped all over it. So you, you, you want to find the best deals. As far as what comes, what, you know, I'll worry about what comes later on. Um, right now, I'm more, you know, out of 20 deals, I might find one or two that I want to buy. Okay. Um, so with Alcoa reporting yesterday, or was it the day before? Remember when Alcoa used to yesterday. start earnings season? Um, yeah. So what do you see in tech earnings? Well, I, I think it's going to be a lot like last quarter. I think, I think a lot of the companies that probably had good reports last quarter probably have a good report again this quarter. Um, so, and, and the setup is a lot better now. Again, I mean, I was, you know, we, we planned these webinars ahead of time. Three or four weeks ago, you know, I was like, okay, well, am I going to go into a Splunk report with a straddle on or a short play? Well, you know, they took the stock from 100 down to, you know, low 60s. All of a sudden, um, the, the earnings hurdle that they have to jump over is is way is is a, is, a, is hugely lowered. So whether it's a Splunk, a FireEye, a Workday, uh, a Now, a ServiceNow, um, a Tableau software, I think the setup for a lot of that stuff is is very very good. Um, you know, now same thing. You know, I was looking. Okay, I'm going to carry my Pandora short into earnings, and if they don't, if they if they basically produce the same report as they did last quarter, it should get demolished. Well. You know, that, I was kind of thinking that thought when Pandora was 36 to 38. 
all of a sudden it went down to 25. So I'm sort of reevaluating the stuff that I was I was looking at on the short side because some of the stuff might have gotten hit too much and the setup is not as juicy to to bankable to be a bankable short. Again, I mean, what was Amazon? wasn't that long ago that it was almost four hundred dollars. It almost hit three hundred the other day. I still don't really like the name, but it's it's a tougher short at three hundred, low three hundred than it was at three eighty to four hundred. Um, as far as Apple and Google, you know, it, Google hasn't really had a good quarter. The stock has reacted great the last two quarters, but I I'd have to go back to like three or four quarters ago to where I'm like, wow, this is a really good Google quarter. In fact, probably the last time I thought Google had a great quarter, the stock probably it took like four to six weeks to react uh, kind of quote unquote the right way. Um, but I, I kind of think it wouldn't surprise me if they try to hit these two after earnings because I think Google will probably have about the same report as they just did, which really wasn't very good. The stock shouldn't have gone up after the last quarter, but it did. So this time might be kind of a, a, a day of reckoning for them. Um, in Apple, it's just, I mean, what do they have to do? They had $22.7 billion in free cash flow last quarter, and everybody pinged because the iPhone sales number was a little bit light. I mean, you, you basically produce a Berkshire Hathaway type cash flow number or, or better, and it didn't seem to matter. So, so you know, it, it's just, it, it's almost like playing the odds that they're going to, the machines are going to hit these two names and just be pre prepared to buy the dip after they report. Um, as far as Twitter, you know, I would be super, super bullish on Twitter, except every week that goes by is a week closer to their, their lockup. I don't think the lockup's going to be a big deal, and in fact, I think the lockup is going to be the catalyst that really, really ignites the stock, just like it did Facebook uh, last year. Um, but again, you know, I mean, Twitter blew away the quarter last quarter, but it didn't really matter. Um, but I, if, if, if they have as good of a quarter as they did last quarter, and they don't have this user engagement or user growth issue, it, it, it could be tough to keep the thing much under 45. So again, it's going to be a lot that is going to be dependent on where it's trading the day before. Um, I'm going to be pretty bullish on Twitter ahead of the quarter. If it goes down, I'll just buy more, I'll just buy calls, or I'll just buy leaps or something like that. Um, because I do think the setup's closing in to what, to what Facebook looked like. Um, and then overall, I, again, given the correction and given the severity of the drop in a lot of these these companies, I've kind of moved from a cautious on this quarter earnings view to now my non-consensus view is that I think this quarter is probably going to be the reactions are going to be better than they were last quarter because the stocks have have a lot of froth taken out. The other the other thing I think could happen is last quarter was sort of middle of the road. You kind of had okay reports, okay guidance. Um, I actually think there's a potential for guidance to be better this quarter than it was last quarter. I, 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 out of the names I like, put it that way. I, I'm not, I can't say that for the whole universe, but out of, let's say, the 20 or 30 names that I favor, I think their guidance is probably going to be to the upside this quarter versus last quarter. And, and again, anybody that has any earnings questions, you know, feel free to fire away on those too. Okay, um, you know what, I have an earnings question, um, and I'll keep it a little broad. What do you, about, what do you think about names like, um, like IBM, Cisco, Accenture that are kind of economically sensitive, you know, those big kind of names? I, I guess I'm a Microsoft in also, like those kind of big old school techs. Um, how do you think they're going to do? I think it's name by name. I think Cisco, I, I'm probably a little more moving, uh, more bullish on Cisco. I think something like EMC, same thing. IBM's t the IBM there again. I mean, I have to go back and really think hard. Like, when was the last time IBM actually had a real, had a good quarter? I mean, stock reacts okay sometimes, but now here again. So, so I wrote a big piece, and I was, you know, I was I was harping on that we're going to have to see a, a basically a rotation of large count value. This was about three or four weeks ago. Um, so I was lightening up on some of the stuff. I was basically buying some of the stocky old stuff. And, um, and, and it's kind of played out. So there again, if, if IBM is running into the quarter hot and it's gone up a lot, um, I think the risk to a disappointment is higher. So it, it, you, it's a tough deal to do. I think you have to go name by name. Um, it, so let's just say it's going to be a mixed bag. I, I do think a few of them are going to be okay. Microsoft's probably going to be okay. Microsoft, funny enough, has actually a pretty good product cycle right now going for it. So that's what's helping them. And again, I think Cisco's going to do fine. Um, but a lot of the other ones, I mean, Accenture had disappointing news already. IBM, again, who knows? I mean, that's a name I'll probably look to be more on the short side than the long side, to be honest. So, um, but it, this, I don't think you can paint the earnings picture this quarter with a sort of a whole sector or a broad brush. I think a lot of people want to do that, 
but I, I think that's a dangerous. I think that'll be a dangerous game. Okay. Um, before we head to the Q and A, why don't you just give your final thoughts? And I think it's important this point you make about, you know, bottom kicks. I think that's really important for people to understand. You bet. So, well, we kind of covered this market. I mean, it's got. We're, we're either going to have differentiation or we're going to have risk off. I think we just had a huge dose of risk off. So my guess is, in, by differentiation, people just sort of evaluate, look at things name by name by name. And I, I, my, my bet is we're going to see more differentiation than risk off, especially since we just had a big dose of it. Um, and I already covered guidance. So what I talked about, when I talk about catching bottom ticks, everybody wants to catch a bottom tick. They want to talk about, oh my god, I just bought FireEye at 48.75 and today it's hit 54. So I mean, I trade every day. I trade for a living. I, you know, if you trade a lot, you're going to catch some bottom ticks. But the, it's, to me, it's the trade that sticks. It's not the bottom tip that matters. And what I mean, a great example is Facebook last year. So I, mean, I was trading Facebook you know, every week, sometimes every day. And I mean, there's a very good chance that I, I bought some Facebook last year, or maybe it was 14 or 16 months ago now, within 50 or 60 or 70 cents of the ultimate low in the stock. But the thing is, I'm sure, in fact, I know this, when I got a 10 or a 15 or a 20% bounce off that trade, I was gone. I sold it. Um, in fact, it was probably more like an 8 to a 12% bounce. I probably sold that trade. Now, I was also buying Facebook at 24, 26, 27 bucks. And uh, some, of, some of those purchases were before the bottom. Some of them were after the bottom. But you know what? I also held Facebook all the way to 57. Not my whole position, but I had I had a good a good chunk of it still to between fifty five and fifty seven dollars, and so I wasn't selling nineteen or twenty dollar cost basis Facebook at fifty seven. I was selling my twenty four, twenty seven, twenty eight dollar stock. So the bottom line, you you it doesn't really matter if you bottom tick something. In fact, it's totally meaningless. What matters is can you keep trading well and making some incremental money along the way, and if you get a good name that does really well. Do you end up keeping it long enough to make real money on it? That's the key. So it's it's the trade that that you can keep and have faith with faith in, and 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 one you can ride. You can you know you can ride 50, 100, 150, 200 percent. Another stock is a great example is Google. I, I bought Google at 363 years and years ago, um, and I basically held that Google all the way through. And, and you know could I have sold it? Should I have sold some before 2008? Whatever. Well. It was still a triple. I mean, at the end of the day, it was still a triple. So, you know, there's lots of other, lots of other maybe lower entries I got on Facebook, maybe a, a 2008 entry or an early 2009 entry. Again, I shed those entries relatively quick. But, I, you know, I had Facebook all the way from 2006, maybe even before. I was used to owning it between 350 and 400 bucks. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of got immune with that, that part of the position. I was like, I'm keeping this come hell or high water, or basically until the stock got, got too expensive in my view. So anyway, I think that's a, that's a good, that's a, if you're going to trade tech and biotech and highly volatile sectors too, you kind of have to have this, I'm going to trade part of the position and i got to keep some of the position because these things are just going to move all around. I, I, a traditional technical analysis on these names doesn't work great a lot, in a lot of cases. So you have to have faith in what you do. You have to have belief. And uh, you, there's just certain names. If you want to make you know, the five-bagger, the ten-bagger, the only way you do that is by riding through some rough patches from time to time. OK, that will bring us to the Q&A. Now, I was going to start off with my own question, but we have about 20 questions on Gigamon, ticker G-I-M-O, for people sure. at home. So what do you think of Gigamon? I like it now. So, I mean, I, again, people can sign up and read. I mean, I was selling Gigamon. In fact, I completely closed the position out uh, in the low to mid 30s. I, I want to say 33, 34 dollars. Um, so, th this market ha makes us all feel like an idiot from time to time. I felt like such a hero when I sold it, and literally late last week, I bought some at 26, 26 and change. I'm like, oh, this is so great. The stock just went from 36 to 26. Um, I was out of it. Now I'm free. I can buy it. And you know, two days later, they warn. Um, so, so here's the bottom line. I was very good, and I traded Blocks really well. Um, blocks was a company that literally, I think they warned and went down 48%. So I was buying Blocks at between 17 and a half and 18 and a half, and I don't know, made somewhere between 20 and 30% pretty much on that total position. Um, so Gigamon, given the severity of the miss, they only missed, they only missed the guide by about 9%, maybe 10. So I kind of thought, okay, Gigamon, maybe it'll go down to 21, 22, 23. 
Um, to me, you know, again, you you could make a case it really should have, maybe it was already priced in at 26. So the fact that Gigamon went down 30 to 35 percent more below 26, um, I've been buying it. You know, I, I've got an average cost of about 1770 to 1790 the last couple of days. If it goes lower, I'll buy a little bit more. Uh, in fact, I'm going to have a Twitter argument with somebody here pretty soon because I saw that they were talking that they think Gigamon's worth 1250. So I remember people thinking Broadsoft was worth 1250. I remember people saying a rune was going to trade at 1250. I remember people saying Riverbed was going to stay at 1250. Every one of those names I traded and did well on, and I think Gigamon's going to be the same. So I, I don't think you can go nuts on it because. So, so here's a great example. If FireEye was at 95, I would buy a lot more Gigamon than I've been buying. But FireEye has been trading between you know 49 and 52 the last four or five days. So it's hard for me to buy more Gigamon than FireEye. Same thing. I've been buying Splunk between 61 and 64. Same thing. And so, so all those other purchases of other names takes money away from what I can ultimately put in a Gigamon. But I, do, I, I like it enough, and I think the try again. I think it's worth 22 to 26 bucks minimum. Um, the other thing is it's only trading at four times net cash, and it's an interesting grower. It's already cash flowing. Again, this could be one of those names that gets caught up in the uh, in the M and A deal. So I think Broadsoft's going to get bought out at some point in the next year or so. I think Gigamon now. If Gigamon doesn't get back up to sort of that twenty six to thirty five level, um, somebody might take a run at them. So again, I wouldn't go nuts on it. I'm not going nuts on it, but I certainly have no problem buying it at seventeen fifty a share. Okay, uh, we have a question from Brandon Perry. Brandon Perry wants to know, what do you think about Brandon Perry's bullish call in FireEye yesterday? Well, I think it's a genius call because basically uh, that's what I think. So I think, I think a bullish call on FireEye uh, in the low 50s is, is a great bullish call. And I've written uh, mountains on, on the stock. And again, you know, I, th I think it's worth about 70 to 75 near term. Um, by the way, there was a company, uh, it's not really a competitor of theirs, but it's in a space called Imperva, IMPV. They issued an earnings warning. By the way, their earnings warning was way, way worse than uh, Gigamon's, um, just kind of tech to tech. And they're down about 30%. So um, I might even buy more FireEye tomorrow if, uh, you know, if it's down two or three bucks like it is in the after hours. But, yeah, no, I think it's a good call. I think the stock's worth a lot more. Again, I, I think, I mean, don't get too caught up in trying to make five or seven or ten bucks in, in certain names. I, FireEye, Workday, and a few other companies are platform companies. What did CRM do in the last five years? It went up four or five or tenfold. What did Google do over a five-year period of time? It went up four or five or tenfold. So, I mean, uh, FireEye is one of those names that I think could be a platform category killer. And platform category killers don't trade in a 20-point range. They go up 40 or 50 or 60 percent, then they correct, then they do it again. Um, but, you know, these, this is the kind of company that could, you know, five years from now, it could be doing five billion in revenue and it's only doing 600 million right now. So, you know, these are the things that, that these kind of companies can get huge and you've got to keep that in mind. Okay, in conclusion, Brandon Perry, you are right. Um, okay, so we'll move on. Uh, so what do you think about Chinese Internet stocks? We've seen, you know, emerging markets have been doing fairly oh, well. So, um, you know, are Chinese Internet stocks like um, Sina, Baidu, what do you think about them going into earnings? Sina is, is torturing me like no other stock has tortured me in a long time. I, you know, I probably should have stuck with Baidu. I made a really, really good call last year when, every, I mean, everybody hated Baidu when it was under 90 bucks. And every technician in the world was pointing at pointing at charts and saying, "Oh, if it breaks 85, it's going to go to 60." Blah 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 blah. Well, guess what? It didn't. It, it was a great buy at 85. It was a great buy at 92. It was a great buy at 95, and the stock went and it doubled from there. So I, I was a little, I, I you know, I sold it. I don't love Baidu, so I think I don't know. I probably made 30 or 40 percent and sold it. I probably should have just stuck and trade, kept trading Baidu. It seems like every time I venture out to another name, I get I get my you know what handed to me. I'm in Sina. I'm going to stay in Sina. I'm probably going to lose money on Sina, but I'm going to stay in it. I'm going to watch this Weibo IPO come out, and I'm going to watch a bunch of people say Weibo is worth $8 billion when it's not. Um, but the bottom line is I'm, I'm sticking with it. I do think Sina is going to go up. I, I do think it's worth more, but it's, it's a tortured, tortured stock. Um, I do like Qunar. Uh, Q-U-N-R is a spinoff. It's the travel spinoff of Baidu. I, that's actually, if I had to pick a favorite China Internet name, that would be it. 
Um, they're, I mean, they're basically set up to be the, you, you know what these Chinese companies do is they, is they find the best platform to copy and they copy the, the U.S. company. So, so QNR is trying to become sort of the, the price line of China. And you know what? Baidu has become the, the Google of China, so QNR might be able to do that. The other one I still like is Yoku. It doesn't trade the best nowadays, but um, that's a video a play. And I, I do like uh, QNR and Yoku. Uh, again, I'm going to own Sina for a while. I, I do. I mean, I think it's worth minimum 75, maybe 80, 85. But that thing is just trading terrible. But you know, I'm going to keep it on the sheets as a warning of what not to do, um, and we'll see what happens. Okay. Uh, how about Priceline? What do you see with Priceline? Uh, I was recommending Priceline as kind of one of my bubble stocks and very shortable, and I was right, and I'm mad at myself that I didn't do more on it than I did. Um, it's dropped, what did they drop, 15, 20%? I, I don't think it's a short for now, um, but I'm not that crazy about the name. I mean, I, I always wondered, for example, like, what, you know, why do people like Priceline more than Google? Why do people like Priceline more than Apple? Why do people like Priceline more than Twitter? I mean, I, I, mean, I, I did way better in Facebook, uh, you know, writing Facebook from the low 20s to the high 40s, low 50s, mid 50s. So. You know, I, I don't know. I think they're better names at better prices. It's a very dominant company. They're very good at what they do. Um, they've done a very good job with m and I hope Apple uh, kind of looks at that as a good example. But they've, they've done a very good job of buying out companies that could be um, disruptive threats to them. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, it, I guess if it goes back to 1300 I'm going to look to do shorts on it. Um, it's not one of the names I trade in a lot, and I, I, I like other stuff better, but there's no way I'd short it right here, and I think it could keep bouncing. Today, it had a huge bounce, and, you know, it could retrace most of the downward move. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of these names that just had these huge corrections retrace anywhere from 68 to, to 80% of the down move. So if Baidu does that, I mean, it's, it's going to go up quite a bit from where it is here. Or, I mean, uh, price line is going to go up quite a bit from where it is here. Okay, uh, how about Tesla? I don't like Tesla. I haven't liked Tesla for a long time. Um, uh, I don't hate it. I, I could see how they could how they could keep gaining market share and sales. But I mean, you know, I'm a numbers guy. I I, I got to be able to kind of get to a valuation that I can calculate and that works and that makes sense. And I mean, you guys. I mean, I like growth companies. I mean, there's a lot of times I'll be bullish on a growth name that other people think I'm wrong on, then I end up being right on. And you you're not going to be right on every one of these names. But I'm a pretty I have a pretty good hit percentage. It, I just can't get there. I, I can't model Tesla's numbers in such a way that it makes sense. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I would go out there and do a lot of shorts. I do. I, I have shorted Tesla a few times um, on short-term, short-term trading basis, um, but I just can't. I can't get there from the long side. I, I, I don't think it's a technology company. Everybody says it is. I mean, uh, it's an auto company. They do have some good technology. If they change how the world uses batteries and they invent new battery platforms that are three or four or ten times better than the batteries that we have today, then I'm going to be completely wrong and it could be a really, really special company. But I, I'm not there. I just can't get there on Tesla. Okay. Uh, how about Checkpoint Software? Uh, ticker C it's a short. Yeah, I've kind of answered that. It's a short. Checkpoint's a competitor of, uh, in that FireEye space. I think, I think Checkpoint's a short. Uh, I, w I don't know if I'd short it naked, meaning if, if you don't own FireEye or some other security company, I'm not sure I would, I would just be short Checkpoint to be short it. But um, I, th those are companies I look to basically short and pair off against some of my long trades. So I I'm, I'm basically believe you should be long FireEye and short, short Checkpoint. Okay, how about Amazon? Um, well, I mean, I've pretty much nailed my negative call from the start of the year. Uh, Amazon has been a big underperformer. Um, at, at, again, down here with the correction it's had, I, I, I'm not going to be short Amazon here. But I tell you what, if, if they don't have something decent to say on the quarter, um, either with more growth or better numbers or some sort of positive surprise in the quarter, I think it could have a tough time. So uh, I have, I mean, I have zero interest in buying Amazon here. Other than, I mean, there might be an intraday trade that, that pings off from time to time. But uh, there's just so many names I like better. You know, there's so many platform, new platform companies, the security space, the emerging networking space. 
um, or Apple. I, I mean, I'd, I'd rather own Apple than, than own Amazon for long term. So, uh, you know, I'm, right now it's sort of a do-nothing name because if they, if they were to pop a lot, then I'm going to put them back on my short list. Um, and, you know, if they get cheap enough, I can make a case that they're, <clears throat> you know, at 225 to 250, I'd probably think they're a pretty good buy. Okay, and that will bring us to our final question, and that is, do you think Intel will move into new business verticals or stay with its bread and butter? Well, I do think they're going to move into one. Well, I would say that fabrication of chips is their bread and butter, but they don't really do that for as a commercial enterprise for a ton of other companies. They, they do do a deal with Altera right now. I, I Put it this way, my, I, I think Intel is going to go a lot higher. My thesis on Intel is that eventually it's going to become one of the most dominant fabrication companies on the planet. So in, in a sense, from sort of a Wall Street perspective, that would be considered a new vertical. Um, I do think they could make billions upon billions of dollars in chip fabrication over and above what they do right now. And they really do have the best technology in the world. Um, so it's just a matter of them applying their the best of breed technology and going out and winning customers and sort of disrupting the foundry business. Um, and I think they could do it, and if they do do it, uh, that's one of those, you know, of the old guard companies, I think they're going to report well. And that's one of my, so Cisco and Intel would be one of my other favorites. I, I really like Intel. I mean, a lot of people like have a, you know, they could say, oh, Intel might go to 30. I think Intel could go to 40 bucks. So, uh, you know, that's not in four or five months, but uh, I think Intel has way, way more upside. Intel kind of reminds me of just sort of a larger version of Micron, which was a very good stock for me last year. So there's a lot of potential, um, and I do think if they enter the fabrication business and win some key clientele and win a lot of business, um, that's a huge revenue growth uh, avenue for them. Okay, that will bring us to the end, but Sean, we hope you'll join us again. As always, we very much appreciate your company. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank you. you. Have a good day.